After you buy your night vision device and your adapter and your mount and your helmet and your counterweight pouch and your ear pro adapters, multiple IR strobes, a task light, and some cool IR morale patches, you still have to configure your chosen night fighting rifle for use with night vision. So today we are talking about laser beams and stuff, specifically infrared illuminators and designators. We've tested a variety of standalone and combination units, and I'm going to talk about all the ones that we currently have experience with. First, let's talk about what to look for in general when it comes to laser units. Based on our experience so far, I highly recommend a combination unit with an illuminator and a designator. There are a bunch of reasons to prefer a combination unit, from ergonomics to cost to weight and bulk. At the end of the day, you are going to want an IR aiming laser and an IR illuminator, and you're going to want them in the same unit. The main reason you're going to want a combination unit is so you can turn them both on with one button. This can be accomplished with separate units, and we'll talk about that later, but for reasons we'll get into, I don't recommend it. Also, the weight and size of the unit are pretty important. Most likely, you're going to mount your laser unit at the front top of your rail, and that adds a lot of swing weight to the gun. If you also have a suppressor and a white light, it'll start getting front heavy and unwieldy pretty fast. At the end of the day, I'm not going to recommend you spend a lot of money and time tracking down a full power laser. Yeah, it does feel bad to buy a cucked civilian powered laser, but in all the shooting that we've done, it has never mattered, and it probably won't actually matter to you either. Again, more about that later. Also, I don't think a Viz laser is a requirement at all. It does help a bit when zeroing, yes, but you can always zero without it, and just remember that people who actually shoot with Viz lasers get made fun of for a reason. At the end of the video, there's going to be some side-by-side -side comparisons of different devices, after we talk about all the beta we've gathered so far. Let's start with the laser unit we currently recommend the most, the Steiner D-Ball I-2, specifically the 9007 version, also called the PEC-2, on Steiner's website. The other versions of the D-Ball I-2 have dual lasers, one Viz and one IR, but there's no reason to ever pay that much for a unit with no illuminator. The 9007 version has an IR laser and an IR illuminator. The illuminator is also laser-based rather than LED-based like on the D-Ball D-2. That means the power is limited to what's considered relatively eye-safe for civilian use. Like with most combination units, the selector switch on the D-Ball I-2 allows you to select low and high modes and combinations of laser, illuminator, or both. The illuminator is focusable from a wider pattern for close-range illumination to a tighter pattern for longer-range illumination. These are all features that are pretty common regardless of what unit you end up getting. One reason to recommend the D-Ball I-2 is that it has everything you need and nothing you don't. It's low profile, it's small, and it's lightweight at only 8 ounces. It's also one of the cheapest combination units you can get, usually running right around 800 bucks. Yes, it is limited to civilian power, but it's still totally usable, especially considering you're probably going to mount it to a short-barreled AR, since that's all anybody shoots anymore. Standard 5.56 out of your Mark 18 clone really only retains lethality out to about 50 yards anyway. The D-Ball I-2 can be used with the fire button on top of the unit instead of a remote switch, but a switch is recommended for ergonomic use. A good way to set it up is paired with a Surefire dual pad for use with your visible light, or a Unity mod button, or hot button, or tap switch, etc. The runner-up option for a cost-effective laser unit is the Holosun LS321R, or G. This is basically the Holosun version of a D-Ball A3. Holosun's laser units are usually priced like a D-Ball that's one tier lower. So the LS321G is priced like a D-Ball I-2, but it has the features of the A3. The LS321R and G have an IR designator with a coaxial Viz laser for zeroing and an IR laser illuminator. These are available with either a red or green Viz laser, as indicated by the letter on the end of the model name. I don't really care either way, but the red version is like 50 bucks cheaper. The green laser is more visible during the daytime, but we've already established that doesn't fucking matter, so don't worry about it. These Hollow Sun laser units are pretty solidly built. I think these are some of the most expensive products they make, and they seem to be targeting the LE market pretty heavily. The Hollow Sun LS321 is laid out like a D-Ball, and it controls pretty much the same way. A switch controlling the intensity and combination of different modes on the left, and on the right, a knob to control the focus of the illuminator beam. The illuminator and designator on the LS321 are also limited to civilian power, and they do seem to be a little dimmer than the D-Ball I-2. The tape switch Holosun includes with all of their laser devices is awful. It's mushy and inconsistent, and the Picatinny adapter mount for it is bulky and cheap. Definitely do not bother with the included switch. All of their lasers are compatible with all the standard laser plug switches, like the PEC-15 switch, Unity Taps, Hot Button, Mod Button, etc. Luckily, the fire button on the unit itself is actually pretty good in design and feel. However, the unit is significantly taller than an i2, so it's not the most ergonomic way to activate the device. 
Overall, the LS321 is a solid device. However, it basically costs the same as a D-Ball i2 with the Illuminator. You do get that Viz laser as a bonus. However, I think this unit could stand to sit a little bit lower on the rail. I also tested the Holosun LS117IR. This is a standalone laser designator unit with nothing else on it. It's available in red, green, or IR. It's basically the Holosun equivalent to the Steiner Otal C. Once again, we're talking about a Civ powered laser, although it's still completely usable, just like the Otal is, I'm sure. The LS117, like the Otal C, doesn't have a fire button. You either switch it to be always on, or you switch it to the remote momentary mode and use a standard laser plug button, like the other units we've already talked about. This one comes with the same shitty tape switch as the LS321. The LS117IR is a good cheap option if you just need an IR designator, like if you don't want to commit to a whole combo unit on a gun you don't intend to use primarily for night shooting. If you mount the 117 on a standard AR rail, it's going to be directly in line with the bore, which does make it easy to zero at all ranges, and it's a very lightweight, compact unit. However, if you want to run one of these alongside an illuminator, you won't end up saving any money, and you'll have some serious ergonomic issues to contend with, which brings us to another thing we've tested, the Surefire M300 Vampire Light. This is a Surefire Scout Light body, either a 300 or a 600, with the Surefire KM1E dual mode head. Rotate the light bezel to switch between visible mode, IR mode, or safe. In IR mode, the vampire light has a huge amount of spill illumination. It is much brighter and with a much wider pattern than the civilian power laser-based illuminators on the LS321 or D-Ball I2. This thing seems pretty impressive until you pull the trigger. The huge light spill causes two problems. One problem is that it illuminates everything around you, which isn't super tactical and may also cause your NV device to automatically dim. Kind of counterproductive if you're trying to ID a target far away. No matter how much you're lighting up the far away target, you're lighting up the grass at your feet even more, and the grass is much bigger. It takes up a lot more of your intensifier's field of view, and therefore you get auto brightness, auto gain, and auto gating all competing to see who can ruin your fucking day the fastest. Problem number two, all of that spill illumination is going to reflect badly off of the gun smoke every time you pull the trigger. Like driving with high beams on in the fog, the narrower, more focused, laser-based illuminators we've tested do not have that problem. In some of the footage of us using the Surefire IR head, you might notice a sidestep after taking a shot. That's not some cool, tactical get-off-the-X shit, that's just us trying to get away from our own blinding cloud of smoke. The last problem is one of controlling your pileup of devices hanging off of the end of your gun. I mostly tested the Surefire Vampire paired with the Holosun 117, with both devices slaved to a Unity Taps pressure switch. The regular version of the Taps has two leads, one for Surefire lights and one for standard lasers, each with their own control button. With the tap switch mounted on the right side of the handguard, it kind of worked. I could press both buttons at the same time to get illumination and laser working in tandem. A better option if you were mounting it on the top rail of your gun would be the Unity Taps Sync, which can activate both devices off of one button and one device off the second button. But the Taps is already pretty expensive at about 130 bucks, and the Sync is like an extra 50 bucks. They're both just like fucking huge too. None of this really matters because you're not even saving any money doing this. Ballpark 350 for the light, 250 for the laser, 150 for the switch, and now you're at the cost of a D-Ball I2, but with a less useful illuminator and obnoxious controls. You save a couple of bucks and a couple ounces not having to run a separate white light, but it's really not worth it. Just skip the whole thing. Now we get to have some fun and talk about the Zenitco Pursed series of laser units. Since these are Russian lasers, they're kind of in a legal gray area, and that means they can crank out way more power than the neutered civilian market shit you can usually buy in this country. We've used the 1, the 3, and the 4, but let's go over what all the different models are first. The Pursed 1 is a small standalone IR designator. It's like the Russian equivalent to the Otal C or a Holosun 117. However, it's short enough to be mounted onto a pistol rail, which you really can't do with an Otal. The Pursed 2 is their flagship model with all the features. IR laser, visible laser, IR illuminator, white light illuminator, all of it cranked up to unsafe and borderline illegal power levels. That's pretty fucking badass. The Pursed 3 is a Pursed 2 minus the white light and a bit of bulk at slightly reduced power levels. The Pursed 4 has no illuminator, just a slaved viz and IR laser. First up, the Pursed 1. This one is mostly interesting because it can be pistol mounted. There are smaller, lower power pistol IR units made by Steiner and Hollow Sun, but the Pursed 1 is pretty cheap and noticeably more powerful than a civilian safe laser. The Pursed 1 is pretty simple. It's got a pressure button on one side and no power adjustment. The tape switch connector comes out at a weird spot and a bad angle on the unit. It doesn't work well with a pistol or if it's directly rail mounted if you ask me. 
You can use it in tandem with a Zenitco gooseneck rail extension, and that kind of helps the positioning of the unit and the switch, but it's still weird. I haven't used a Pursed 2, and I don't really want to. It's badass, but it's also enormous, heavy, and expensive. I have used the Pursed 3. It's pretty big and heavy, but it does perform very well. The one I tested was an older one with the red laser and the older tape switch design. I didn't really care for the tape switch, it was kind of indistinct, and they're really big. The included rheostat knob on the switches is cool for dialing in your power levels on the fly though. I also used a Pursed 4 on my 11.3 for a while, and a buddy of mine is still using one on his. The Pursed 4 is a decent standalone laser unit. It's much more powerful than a Holosun 117IR, and cheaper than a non-illuminator version of the D-Ball I2. The versions we've used have green Viz lasers and are newer than the Pursed 3 I tested. The tape switch was definitely improved in feel and has an improved quick release connector instead of the screw in like one on the Pursed 1 and the old model of the Pursed 3. In our testing, the Pursed 4 has a more powerful IR laser than the Pursed 3. With both on max power, the 4 was definitely more powerful, but it has an outrageously dirty beam pattern. You get a huge dirty halo all around the beam, so big and wide that it hits the ground 30 feet in front of you. Overall, I don't really recommend any of the pursed lasers. The main issues I have with them is the activation method. A quick press of the button or the tape switch will turn it on and keep it on. For momentary activation, you need a longer press and then it'll stay on as long as you hold the button down. This leads to a lot of accidentally leaving the laser on because you didn't hold the button down quite long enough. You can still get constant on if you want it on other units. For example, double tapping the fire button on the LS321 or the D-Ball I2 puts it into constant on mode, which is useful for zeroing. But that's about the only time you'll want your laser to stay on. Okay, let's take a look at some side-by-side -side comparisons. Up first, the D-Ball I2 versus a combination of a Pursed 4 and the Surefire KM1E dual mode head. So this is maximum on the D-Ball. And what's the minimum on the Pursed? This is all the way down on the Pursed. So it's a little bit less. And then if I, so turn yours off. Turn yours off the Pursed all the way up. <laughs> uh, holy shit. That is just so impressive. And then add in Vampire Whoa. Illuminator. Yep. This is the Surefire Dual Head. Here, I'll show you. This is my high. That's what I got. That's your Illuminator high? Yeah, and laser high. This was a really dark night in a lot of heavy tree cover, and it makes the Pursed 4 and the Vampire Light look pretty impressive. But all that power wasn't really usable. The laser at higher levels is insanely dirty and is just too bright for close-up work. So you drop the brightness down to a usable level, and you end up right where the D-Ball is at max power. The Illuminator doesn't do a great job here either because of the aforementioned problem with overspill and reflection off of your own smoke. Up next, a test of several different lasers pointing at a tree line about 325 to 350 yards away. The Holosun 117IR, the D-Ball I2, and the Pursed 4. What we see here is that all of these lasers get the job done to 300 yards. The D-Ball I2 is running at max, the 117IR is fixed brightness, and the Pursed 4 doesn't need to be cranked up all the way at this distance. Target ID at 300 yards is pretty tough even with a high resolution NV device. Engaging at that distance with a laser isn't easy either. You're not going to be making surgical headshots at 300 yards under night vision. Could a full power laser go further? You bet. It could also go so far that you're designating a target you can barely see with a beam as wide as a Lincoln Continental. There is an application for a laser like that, but not for me. I don't have access to heavy armor support or helicopter gunships. The last test is a close-up comparison of the Holosun LS321R and the D-Ball I2-9007. With the power on high mode with both of these units, the D-Ball has a slight but noticeable edge. If we take a look at the official numbers on these devices, we can see why the D-Ball is noticeably brighter. Both of them advertise a 0.7 milliwatt laser. The Holosun Illuminator is rated at Laser Safety Level 3A. The D-Ball Illuminator is rated at Laser Safety Level 3R. These are two different ways of saying basically the same thing. Both of them have a max allowable power output of 5 milliwatts. If you look into the documentation, Holosun claims that the LS321's illuminator comes in at under 4 milliwatts, and Steiner claims that the D-Ball I2's comes in at over 4 milliwatts. Hey guys, Editor Hop here. If I may just interrupt myself for a moment, I'm here editing the big mess that VoiceOver Hop left behind, and it's becoming pretty obvious to me that Steiner has a mistake on their website. The D-Ball i2-9007 PEC-2 is listed on their website as having a greater than 4 milliwatt illuminator power rating. I initially took that at face value, but it's pretty obvious that's not true, and it's probably just a typo. 
If you compare the power ratings of the i2 to the a3, you notice that the a3 says less than 4 milliwatts, just like a Holosun LS321 and basically every other civilian power laser. So why would the i2 be greater than 4 milliwatts given that the maximum is 5 milliwatts for that class of laser anyway? Most likely somebody just hit the greater than symbol instead of the less than symbol when making that website. So civilian power laser illuminators have to be below 5 milliwatts, and the D-Ball i2-9007, the D-Ball A3, and the Holosun LS321 series are probably all below 4 milliwatts. Of course, we don't know how far below 4 milliwatts they are, which could explain why the i2 is noticeably brighter than the LS321. They also have totally different illuminator assemblies. On the LS321, all of the devices are contained in one lens assembly on the right side of the unit. On the i2, the illuminator's on the left, the laser's on the right. It's hard to say what for sure accounts for that difference, but it's not a difference in advertised power level, just so you know. All right, back to the show. Since the D-Ball i2 is about the same price as the LS321, but smaller and more American, that makes it better by default. The included visible laser doesn't win the LS321 any points, because as we have hopefully established by now, vis lasers are useless garbage. In fact, here's a secret tip from me to you. Wait for it to get dark, Put your nod on, take your AR upper, and point it out the window. You have to make sure it's dark first so you don't get shot or arrested. Turn on your IR designator and your red dot. Check the alignment of your laser with the red dot, first at a nearby building, then a farther away building. If it's consistently close but slightly offset, you're probably just fine. You aren't trying to win a bench rest bullseye competition with an IR designator. Again, do this safely and without freaking your neighbors out. Congratulations, you just zeroed an IR laser without using any ammo and without using those weird targets that expect me to do, like, math and shit. That's all we got for now, guys. If you want me to review a Maul or a D-Ball D2 or something, you better be providing it from your own collection, because I'm done buying this shit for a while. If you have any questions about IR devices, night vision, or whatever, feel free to ask away. I literally don't have anything better to do. See you next time.